Um, our firm was hired to do a preliminary evaluation and a market analysis for a new technology called thermal dehydration. This technology was developed in Israel and was introduced to the North American market late 2020. In North America, the poultry industry requires disposal of about 1.5 billion pounds of broilers and about 187.5 billion or million pounds of layer hens annually. So it's a daily problem. Our producers are currently struggling with it. They're dealt, they're currently dealt with it through incineration. Um, I will say scavenging, I'm not supposed to say that. And the most common is composting, be it an in-bin system, an in-barn system, or a rotary composter. But all of these have issues and challenges that the industry is fighting with. So when we look at new technologies, these, mesh, these new technologies must be manageable by the producer and the labor we have currently working on the farms. They cannot be too complex nor too difficult on a daily basis. They must be socially acceptable and environmentally sustainable, and they must minimize the biosecurity risk to the production facility and reduce the opportunity for disease spread, especially in times like now where we're fighting high path. They should also be economically beneficial, not only to the producer, but the industry as a whole. What is thermal dehydration? It's a process of simultaneously mixing and heating carcass materials to 194 degrees Fahrenheit, which results in a 60% reduction in volume of the biological material in an approximate 12 hour cycle time. If it's a, we'll, we'll talk about capacities, but if it's a partial load, it may only take six hours. If it's a full load, it'll take about 12. It is not rotary composting. There's no addition of any carbon sources, no handling, and it's not incineration because we're only reaching 194 degrees. It results in a meat powder that is stable, odor-free, and sterile. This material can be immediately field applied, and it's equivalent to 160 pound nitrogen fertilizer on a wet basis. But it, because it is stable, it can be stored either on site or a centralized site. We've been storing it now up to a year with no to little to no degradation. And what that has allowed us to do is we now are in discussions and been testing it, putting it into commercial fertilizer, like a pelleted organic product for consumers or utilizing it further processing such, you know, through as a feedstuffs or as a bioenergy process. Right now we're in discussions, but it, there's a few farmers that are selling this for about two to three hundred dollars a ton as a meat powder for these for these opportunities. This is a very a visual show of the thermal dehydration process. It looks very simple, and it actually is very simple, but it's, it was an extreme engineering feat to develop this, and it's very technologically advanced, primarily to keep this cost effective and environmentally sustainable. Now this will be the trick. This is a video we made of the process. This is the small machine. And it's basically, you load birds in, it weighs the birds as they're added. It weighs it throughout the entire process and it starts to slowly turn. Normally, of course, this is all closed up. So you're gonna see steam and stuff you wouldn't, but this is just at the initial phases. And you could still see the birds. Here's after one hour. And it continually just turns and it'll change direction, turn again, but it maintains at 194 degrees and it recycles that heat to keep it more energy efficient. And it'll change, turn, direction, change, just keep mixing up. Now you can see the material after six hours, see how much drier it's gotten, it's broken down. There's no big pieces, there's no carcasses. You couldn't identify what it was. And it will again vary, we, we can run out to 12 hours if it's a full thing or six hours on a small product or a small batch. That's the material coming out. Normally it would go into a super sack or a tote. We put it into a, a tractor bucket so you could see it spread out. There's two models of the thermal dehydration systems available in North America. 
One is a smaller single phase unit with a maximum capacity of 1300 pounds per cycle. But again, it only takes a maximum of 12 hours. So you could actually run two cycles in a 24 hour shift if required. Then there's a larger three phase unit with a maximum of 2000 pounds per cycle. And due to interest from the hatchery industry, they're in development of a 10,000 pound unit for hatchery waste. There's approximately 80 units installed worldwide that have been, because it was developed in Israel, it's been sold out of Israel through, especially through Northern Europe. The first unit in North America went into Center, Texas in 2020. It has been permitted by the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality and deemed NRCS equip eligible. Since this picture was taken, there's been about 10 more units placed throughout the US. And they've all gone through regulatory review and permitting processes. I did an, we did an economic analysis looking at traditional disposal options and the TDS based on one animal unit per day. So thousand pounds of mortalities per day. And as you can see, this is over a 20 year period. One of the benefits of this technology is because we're only running 194 degrees. We have very minimal maintenance requirements versus an incinerator where you end up rebuilding that burner every few years. Total investment came out under 150,000 over the 20 years at a per cost of 0 0.020 which is considerably less than either of the other options. Poultry people didn't like that comparison because a thousand pounds and animal units, not really what they think about. So we, we took an eight barn site. This is an actual site that we put together and we did a comparison of the two technologies because they were looking at a rotary drone, very common unit and the TDS. So the first thing that you notice the physical space required for the units, the building to house them, the TDS only required a 20 by 20 foot building where the rotary required a 60 or a 20 by 80 building because you have to cover that entire unit plus have area for your carbon materials to reside. We tried to match up the maximum loading capacity. That was the largest rotary or drum we could obtain but because you have to add carbon source to the rotor or drum, you're only getting a 20% reduction in volume versus a 60% reduction from the TDS. Everybody asked this one, the TDS requires one kilogram or kilowatt per 10 pounds basically. And there is no carbon source required for the TDS. Manufacturer's rec recommendations for the rotary drum were three to one. And the operation is the part that I've really liked observing growers using it. You fill it, you press the button, you walk away, and that's it. Versus the rotary drum, you still have to monitor temperatures and you still have to add carbon, monitor moisture, etc. When we look at the meat powder, there's an example of it. On an average 100,000 head broiler facility, you'd produce three super sack totes per flock, which in the market today would be $600,000 in value. It moisture is approximately 12%, even though we have found when we store it, depending on the environment, it can range from 10 to 20%. The nitrogen level is 10%, phosphorus is 0.5, potassium is 0.6. This is the big one. Average particle size is 560 microns. You can see in that picture, there's no bone shards, there's no chunks, there's no skulls, nothing that re resembles a carcass. When we look at the meat powder opportunities, it compares very well to meat and bone meal and poultry meal. Digestible nutrients, 82%, crude protein, 76%, and really important, the digestible protein estimate, 92%. We did have done multiple amino acid profilings, so that just gives you an idea where the amino acids lie. We did microbial testings on multiple batches from different sites analyzed by Midwest, looking at, you can see yeast, mold, E. coli, staph, but all results were negative or below reporting limits. We did learn we had to be very careful on how we sampled because you could contaminate the sample or if you left the totes open, you could get aerialized contamination from the farm. We didn't, for our understanding and to work with the regulators, we actually did extensive environmental emissions testing. 
The initial testing was done by EMSI Environmental Services. They did thermal imaging video, which allowed them to do some estimates of gas emissions and also talk stack testing using toxic va vapor analysis analyzer, standard EPA tool. Click on that little picture up above. This is the infrared and see if we can see it. There you go. This is the infrared. And if you look up at the top of the stack, you'll start to see some water vapor. That's the emissions. We had no visible emissions except water vapor throughout the entire process, run over multiple different scenarios. And why that's critical is no visible emissions is in a lot of regulatory requirements. But we did have a slightly elevated VOC at startup until the unit came to temperature. Then we matched background levels at three PPMs and there was no discernible odor in the building, outside the building or at property line. This led us to ask what's actually in the emissions. So we started doing working with Alliance Source Testing and use Eurofins Test America to do GCMS analysis. The procedures are all listed. They're all EPA referenced procedures, but we did a complete profiling of the VOCs. Total particulate emission rate averaged 0 0.0066 pounds per operating hour. Total VOCs, 0 0.0067 pounds per operating hour. But most importantly, all individual compounds were below regulatory thresholds. And semi-volatile organic compounds were all below minimum detectable levels. What this let us do when we took this to the TECQ was there was no limits put on operation. We can operate this 24 seven, 365 days a year. Where in Texas, you can only operate an incinerator during the daytime because of pollution issues. As I said, I'm not in, involved with, with the sales market or anything. So I just want to put this up. The two distributors in the US are Phoenix Century and they handled the West and Midwest and Innovative Poultry Products, which handles the East Coast. So if you want any information on the actual system purchasing, reach out to them. If you have any questions on the research side of it, shoot them to me. I'm, ha I'm happy to answer anything. And with that, I think that's it. There is a question on whether there was any odor reported by the operators. And once they learn the system, no. It's, there's always a learning curve. But the operators have taken it, just love it, that have purchased it and put it in so far. Um, and that's why it's spreading. You know, they have, they've just starting to do sales, but the, it's just due to demand, especially with high path AI and the concerns with bin composting and tracking that in and out, that there's been a lot of interest in this technology.